for those who might be our guests today or who are catching us online for the first time, let me explain that we're in the latter half of a summer Q&A series based on actual questions submitted by people who are a part of our congregation. And uh, as you'll tell from today's question, they don't take it easy on me. Today's question is, so how on earth are we supposed to interpret the book of Revelation? No joke, I took a doctoral seminar for an entire semester on that subject, meaning the questioner is asking me to <laughs> compress a doctoral seminar into one 20, 25 minute sermon on that subject. Now, if you have any background at all in church, perhaps you have one of two polar opposite reactions to the notion of spending 20 plus minutes talking about Revelation. The first might be like our friend SpongeBob up there on the screen. <laughs> you just want to avoid it. It's like a fruitcake at Christmas. <laughs> Impenetrable and tastes bad. <laughs> the other way that people in especially American Christianity for the last 100, 150 years is that they've relied too much on the book of Revelation. And oftentimes there are fairly strange, even crazy theological notions that come about when people rely on this one very different looking book in the Bible too exclusively. Uh, true story, many a cult have used Revelation and its strangeness as the basis for their cultish beliefs. So if you struggle with knowing what on earth to do with the book of Revelation, you're in good company. This is what the great Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, said about Revelation. It's why, by the way, it's one of two books at the end of his German version of the Bible. Revelation is neither apostolic nor prophetic. I can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. They are supposed to be blessed who keep what is written in it, and yet no one knows what that is. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. The great atheistic philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said it this way, it is the most rabid outburst of vindictiveness in all of recorded human history. I think the irony there is if you've ever read Nietzsche, some of his stuff is pretty rabidly vindictive too. The Irish poet and playwright George Bernard Shaw said it this way, Revelation is the curious record of the visions of a drug addict. All right, so what on earth are we to do with this book that lies at the end of your New Testament called Revelation? Well, I'm going to give you four principles by which you ought to read the book, if you dare. But we need to start by describing what Revelation is. Revelation is a kind of literature, spiritual literature, that was fairly common in the Jewish and Christian worlds around the time of the New Testament. It's something called an apocalypse. There are quite a few Jewish apocalypses that never made it into the Holy Scripture, but that were written between the close of the Old Testament and the start of the New, so between 400 B.C. and the life and times of Jesus. Books like Second Esdras, or the Book of Jubilees, things you've never heard of, but they were very common in the ancient world. There are other Christian apocalypses that were written that did not make the Holy Bible, but they still were an expression of the Christian faith during the time of the New Testament and then also after, the most famous being something called the Shepherd of Hermas. Now, what's an apocalypse? So an apocalypse is a genre of literature, a kind of literature, that is a, a heavenly vision. Apocalypse literally means an unveiling or an uncovering. It's as if the author is going to pull back the veil on what you think is going on in the present or in human history, and he's going to help you see into the depth, the truth 
of things. He's going to help you see things from a heavenly point of view. So the first thing you need to know about apocalypses is that they are poetry. And this is problematic. As N.T. Wright put it, the eminent biblical scholar of our day, a great majority of the Bible, the Psalms, the prophets in the Old Testament, Revelation here, are written in poetry. And the problem is we live in a culture that doesn't read or write poetry anymore. Poetry is the language of the heart. A poem is supposed to make you feel something. A poem is supposed to spark your imagination. It is meant to evoke something in you. A poem is not a set of blueprints. A poem is a piece of classical music. The melody moves, it swells, and it ebbs. There's a melody that changes over time, and yet it's united from start to finish. It's all the pieces playing together, and when you hear it done well, words defy how beautiful it is. An apocalypse being poetry is far less a museum of science, and it is far more a museum of art. So part of our struggle with Revelation is we're no good at reading poetry and appreciating it, and it is a, a very long extended poem. The second trait you need to know about an apocalypse, i.e. revelation in your Bible, is that it is almost entirely symbolic. And those symbols are drawn from almost exclusively two places. The Old Testament and the Greco-Roman world into which it is written. Which means most of us have just struck out because we don't know the Old Testament, and we don't know the Greco-Roman world because it's not our world. We're 2,000 years removed from it. And I realize that's two strikes, not three, but you get the analogy. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of examples of how the symbols work in Revelation and how it informs what you as the reader are supposed to take away from what you're reading. So in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 are comprised of seven letters to seven actual churches in the Eastern Roman Empire. To one of these churches in the town of Sardis, we read, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, we'll talk about that word in a little while, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone. And on that white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Do you see that just in that one verse, you have both the Old Testament and the Greco-Roman world represented? Manna is from the Old Testament. You cannot possibly understand this encouragement to this particular church if you don't know the story about manna and how then the New Testament talks about Jesus being the manna from heaven. But maybe more interesting would be white stones. Do you know that in the Greco-Roman world, if you were invited to an elite party event or banquet, you would be given a white stone. And on that stone would be written or etched either your name or a secret password that you then would gain admission into the event with. Does that not completely inform what it is that you're reading here if you understand the Greco-Roman meaning of white stone? You see it? Here, one more, and you'll see it again. This is from toward the end of Revelation. So this is when, this is from the final scene of Revelation, which is Revelation 21 and the first part of Revelation 22, where this beautiful new Jerusalem and new creation is described. This is Revelation 21, verses 16 and 22. And the city has four equal sides, its length the same as its width. And the angel measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. In verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Hmm, interesting description of the city that is this new Jerusalem God is making in the world. First, you'll note 
that the measurements of the city are equal in length and width and breadth. It's a cube. Do you know what was a cube in the Old Testament? The Holy of Holies in the temple. And John is very clear, John the writer of Revelation is very clear to point out that in this city, which is the new creation, the church being the first part of it, there actually isn't a physical temple. The people in all of creation are God's temple. He signals that by saying this new creation and the church that is the forerunner of it is like the holy of holies. You see that? Now, note that it's 12,000 stadia in length. At the time of the writing of this, the Roman Empire was somewhere around 1,500 miles north to south and 1,500 miles east to west, or 12,000 stadia. John is saying here very clearly to the people of his time who would have picked up on this, that this new creation God is making, the church being the vanguard of it, is the replacement for evil, oppressive empires like Rome. Do you see that if you don't pick up on those symbols, you miss entirely what John is trying to say? All right, third word. And this is a word I don't know that anybody would be familiar with. This is a word that refers to a very Jewish and then therefore Christian way of understanding history. And it's the word typology. What's that mean? It means that all of history is locked in this timeless struggle between God and all that opposes God. You could say good and evil, but that's not quite enough. And within this timeless struggle between God and all that is not God, you have repeating patterns and themes. Things seem to recur. By the way, human beings tend to talk about history this way. We use the past to inform how we understand the present. When Kobe Bryant was playing basketball in the NBA, we talked about him as the next Michael Jordan. That's typology. Or we, talk about, we talked about Hilary Swank, the actress for a time, being the next Meryl Streep. That's typology. We look for the next president to be the next John Fitzgerald Kennedy or the next George Washington, or the next Abraham Lincoln. That's typology. That's us using the past and looking for it to repeat itself as a pattern in the present. This is how all of Revelation is structured. I'll show you an example. This is from the famous scene of Babylon the Great riding on the back of the great beast. And as we read this, I want you to ask yourself, what on earth and especially when on earth is John talking. So, John writes, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. On her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. So the beast, this is an Old Testament symbol. It represents the timeless forces that vie against God's goodness in the world. This is often called the chaos beast. In Job, it's called Leviathan. And on the back of this timeless evil rides someone who is described how? Well, on the one hand, it's described as Babylon the Great. Well, Babylon's like one of the chief Old Testament enemies of God's people in the Old Testament. So is this really about Babylon? Or is it about the empire at present that is persecuting God's people in the moment? As the end of the citation reads, which would be Rome. 
also signaled by the fact that on this person's forehead is written her name. In the Roman Empire, if you were a prostitute by profession, you would wear a headband that had your name on it. So do you see that just in this one small passage, you have a merging together of three time frames? There is the timeless forces of evil and injustice that are arrayed against God, symbolized in the beast. You have the present Roman Empire who is described as the second coming of Babylon the Great. That's typology, where we compress time together and we see the present tense as a repetition of a pattern from the old. One more feature that you need to keep in mind if you're going to dare to read this wonderful work of poetry and symbol in the Bible. And it is actually this that unites the entire book together. You have got to keep in mind who the readers are. Revelation is very clear, clearly written during one of two time frames, either the 60 ADs or the, 100s to the, the, nine, the 90s to the 100s AD both of which were times of tremendous persecution for Christian people. They were being imprisoned. They were being outright murdered for their faith. This is a book written to encourage those people to endure what it is that they are experiencing. One of the terms that unites the entire book together from the first chapter to the last is that over and over the readers of this book are, are told to conquer. Better translated, overcome. Drop anchor and outlast the forces of evil that are arrayed against you. The book is meant to help its readers endure and outlast what it is that they were experiencing. So, all that being said, if Revelation is an apocalypse, and we know that an apocalypse has certain traits, like it's a work of poetry, it's symbolic, it sees history as repeating patterns, and it is written to people who, under, who are under tremendous duress, here then are all the things Revelation isn't. Revelation is not propositional. Again, I repeat, it is not a set of blueprints about anything. Revelation is not to be read literally. Revelation is not predictive, meaning it is not solely focused on the future. In fact, Revelation isn't solely focused on any time frame. And last, it most assuredly is not about our context, our time, and our setting. Here's why it's important that I point this out. Within American Christianity for the last 120 years, some of the most popular, populist ways of reading Revelation are on the right side of the screen, not the left. Meaning they commit the errors in red, they don't read Revelation right, represented in green. If you were alive in the 1970s in American Christianity, one of the best-selling books of the decade of the 1970s was written by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth, and it commits every one of those errors in red about Revelation. More recently, the best-selling series of books called Left Behind commit every one of the errors in red up on the screen. The Left Behind series is a terrible representation of the message of Scripture about the present and the future that will unfold. It is a misreading of Scripture. If you're going to read Revelation right, you have to be committed to reading it according to the principles on the left, not those on the right, however popular they may be. Which means... If I feel like I need help when I read Revelation, you should feel that way too. Revelation's a hard book to read because it's so highly symbolic and you and I don't know the symbols because we're not a part of that culture. So, I'm going to recommend a couple of books. If you want to read Revelation, I'll recommend a couple books in the email tomorrow. But I bought two and put them in our library. 
those two up on the screen by two leading American New Testament scholars. Revelation for the rest of us and reading Revelation responsibly, which is a great title given what I've talked about today. If you walk into our library, which is in the other wing, it's the last room down the hallway. If you walk in directly in front of you is across the room is a shelf full of commentaries. I think it's on the second shelf down. You will find those two books have at it. And I hope they help you as you read. But I want to end today more. So I've laid out for you how it is you should and should not read Revelation. I think it's more importantly that we end with what on earth the me- what on earth the message of Revelation is for people like you and me and for the people who were its first audience. What are we supposed to take away from this strange beautiful book of poetry at the end of the Bible? I'm going to let you in on what some of the great biblical scholars of our day say you and I should glean from this book. The first is from Scott McKnight, who wrote one of those books that's now in the library. He teaches at Northern Seminary in Illinois. He says, when you read Revelation, quote, the dragon and the beast seduce humans to worship the wild things and thereby reject worship of the lamb and God on the throne. As Christians, we are to walk in the light that liberates us from the ways of the beast and empowers us to be faithful witnesses. Too many settle for the way of the dragon, justifying it as the way of the world. Revelation is going to present to you a choice as a Christian person. There is the way of Jesus and there is the way of the world. And Revelation is going to encourage you to be committed to the way of Christ, no matter the cost, not to give in to the ways of the world. Now, the professor emeritus of New Testament at Duke Divinity School, Richard Hayes, says it this way about Revelation. This work, that is Revelation, places the Lamb, Jesus, that was slaughtered at the center of its worship and praise as a paradigm for the action of the faithful community. Jesus stands as the faithful witness who conquers through suffering, even suffering to the point of death. Revelation is an example to you and me and to those its first readers of what it means to endure and to live like Jesus. And in part, to live like Jesus means that you are willing to sacrifice and to suffer and potentially, yes, even die as a witness for God's light and life and love in the world. You can see that read this way, Revelation actually leads very directly to the non-violent protests of people like Desmond Tutu and Martin Luther King Jr. Third, P.D. Hansen taught uh, New Testament studies at Yale Divinity School for a long time. He writes about Revelation, quote, Revelation places the oppressor face to face with the ultimate power who is their judge and to whom they must account for their action. Evil will not prevail in the end. To believe otherwise would undermine the hope and courage that has characterized the lives of the saints throughout our religious history. What you and I are supposed to take away from this epic poem at the end of the Bible is that God is committed to seeing justice done. And God is committed to evil not winning. And for all of us and all of creation to be freed from it. So says this New Testament expert. And last, you and I are supposed to take away from Revelation, quote, We bear witness to a certain future, but we know that only God can bring that final future reality to earth as we constantly pray, come Lord Jesus. The beauty of hope and revelation is that it is both personal and global, even cosmic. At the end of the day and at the end of the Bible itself is unquenchable, undeterrable hope. What Revelation teaches us is that God alone can bring about God's hope in the world. 
But because God is certain, hope is certain. And no matter what it is that we endure like those original readers, we rest on the fact that God is sure. Therefore, his hope, not just for us, but for all of creation is equally sure. As one interpreter of Revelation puts it, there is God at the beginning of Revelation, there is God throughout Revelation, and there is God at the end of Revelation. Therefore, we, no matter how persecuted, can be at peace. I want to end today with a prayer that was written based on the verbiage you, f- you find in the book of Revelation. This comes to us from the Uniting Church of Australia. O morning star, splendor of light eternal and bright sun of justice, come and enlighten all who dwell in darkness and in the dark shadow. O king of the whole world, you alone can fulfill the desires of all peoples and make opposing nations one. Come and save us from our own inability to make and value peace. Lord Jesus, you have come and changed the world forever. You continue coming to us day by day, generation by generation, and your spirit lives in us. Come again with finality soon, so that your great end will be our great new beginning. Amen.